certain fields have a stronger impact to this. Um, but as kind of one example of how Amazon will make a public statement on how something does not affect indexing and their public statement is not true. So I'm instead of going through the list and saying, hey, titles are the most important search term field followed by that bullets, et cetera. Um, I'm going to go super deep and basically say, hey, A plus content is indexed and the A plus content alt text field definitely helps your ranking. And as proof to this, uh, anybody that's watching this, if, you, if you've heard otherwise, if you do not believe what I'm just stating, I'll give you a five second test you can go do yourself to find out for yourself and, and check my hypothesis. Put Spanish keywords into one photo's alt text. And within 48 hours, I practically guarantee you'll start indexing for those Spanish terms. And do not have these Spanish terms anywhere else. And that's how I've proven that A plus content and the alt text field does in fact have an effect to indexing. So Stephen, to kind of clarify that test too, is that you're specifically talking about the alt text that is attached to images in A plus content specifically. Correct. Right. So, so Amazon's public facing A plus content does not index, <laughs> which would include photos. They've stated this publicly, but every account we've tested this on states otherwise. And the fastest litmus test is to take a word you don't index for today and add it to the alt text of a photo. And that's why Spanish is a great example to do this because you generally don't have Spanish keywords in your copy. You generally don't have a lot of Spanish in your search terms, but you can. Right. So I know that um, traditionally when, when A plus content first rolled out, uh, we ran a number of tests. And we saw there wasn't, it wasn't indexing at that time, but we've certainly noticed in the past year where it does index the A plus content. So I would certainly concur with that. I don't know that I've done extensive testing in our R&D team regarding the alt text um, but certainly, uh, I, I like the fact that you use like a, a different language, like a Spanish term in order to kind of test that. Cause that's usually kind of an outlier. That's pretty easy to, to pick up on. Does anybody else want to, uh, agree or counter that? I would definitely agree with Steven's sentiment. And I think we might've had an, an exchange or it might've been a post on, uh, LinkedIn and, um, promise hopefully one of my only shameless plugs, but with our, our listing analyzer, that was a, kind of a point of controversy is that we check a plus and ebc content because it's four thousand potential characters on a listing to be able to use that real estate in a meaningful way for uh, relevant keyword phrases so um absolutely it, it does index but i think you know and i think some of the other points that we'll touch on is the relative uh, priority you want to use that real estate right where you know maybe title maybe subject matter has a little bit more heft and Amazon somewhat intuitively, uh, from my perspective, sort of takes this really wide breadth of, of real estate, th something that 4,000 characters, I mean, you think of how short a title is, um, and sort of says, well, this probably is going to include descriptors, other bits of copy and language that are going to maybe describe a product, but it's not going to be that on the nose, direct or main keyword you would necessarily utilize. And I think from a strategy perspective, when you think about the nature of that that portion of a listing indexing, uh, applying that when you think of what keywords you actually do use and the implied intent from Amazon of how you can how you can use that space. Okay, so now one of the areas that I jump into is is for established products. Less less important, I would say, probably a different strategy for uh, if it's a new product versus an established product. And one of the things that I try to convince a lot of people to do is to use, um, which I'll talk about later on as far as the advanced SEO, and that's more of shifting from uh, the, the keyword st stuffing and talking to the search engine and talk more about benefits. Now, what that introduces is potentially removing keywords from key areas like the first 80 characters of a title in order to replace it with something like that's, a, that's got a hook to it, a compelling benefit or feature that is going to hook a shopper to come in to, to increase engagement. Now, my question to, to you, uh, well, to the group, of course, is do you feel that that is fine in cases in order to basically, if you've got, if you've got two or three keyword phrases, let's say in a title to remove those or move them somewhere else or has your experience or observation been that that can have um, bad consequences?
Well, I'll chime in if nobody else is going to. So I, I think one of the slides you have coming up is going to talk about order of text. And you mentioned those 80 characters. Yep. Um, so in the past, it did matter the order of which keyword you put into the mix. And so you'd want to have your best keywords in the front of the title. And there would be a fight, there'd be a friction, and it would be a healthy friction in some instances between conversion and traffic, right? So when you have a friction between traffic and conversion, which of those two should win? Um, I firmly believe it should be traffic nine out of 10 times. I'd be really curious to hear the panel's opinion on when you have to pick either traffic or conversion, which one you go with. I'm, I'm a traffic guy through and through. So because of that, I'm gonna pick keywords that will generate me the most traffic, not the most conversion, because I firmly believe it's four times easier to increase the traffic than it is to increase the conversion, especially when it comes to word choice. Okay, I, I will definitely uh, be taking the uh, the conversion track on this one, but I certainly understand the argument that yes, it is more difficult. It does require a lot more thought to actually do conversion correctly, um, as, as optimizing for conversion that is. Okay. Brandon, Danny, you guys have been yeah, quiet so far. <laughs> yeah. Well, can, can you just reiterate the question? Yeah. So I, I think the kind of question I was throwing out there was as far as the title specifically, how critical it is or not uh, to have a um, single search phrase, multiple search phrases in the title that you're trying to target. In other words, if you start moving things around, start limiting your title to, um, like, say, a single keyword phrase, is that going to have a detriment to your indexing and ranking versus more of a traditional approach, more of a, a ASM approach of, like, how many keywords can we get into the title? Yeah. Well, we know that the title carries more weight than just about any other place in the listing as far as a ranking juice uh, perspective. So I think that it would definitely be a detriment to not include as many as you can. Uh, we also know that match type matters. So, you know, obviously repeating keywords isn't ideal, but you, you do want to have as many of the most important keywords uh, in the title as possible, I would think, uh, to maximize your ranking potential of your product. Can I, can I just step in and just, it's the same part of the question, but just take a little step back from the science literature for A9. So you've got mashing products and queries. So a major problem in understanding queries in product search is determine whether a word or phrase in the query refers to a product type. So that's problem, looking at that problem as well is that whilst using keywords, is it going to be matched to the product, right? So for example, recognizing that addressing the query casual dress refers to a product type and not a modifier as dress shoes or dress socks, all lower and systemic exclusion of non-dress products from the search results. We treat each query as a non-phrase and consider the head of the noun phrase to be the core product type and all the other words query to be modifiers. This is expressed in the problematic uh, context-free grammar, which is trained in an unsupervised manner using uh, variational Bayes. Uh, limited supervision is inserted. So I'll go on to say the second part of the task is assign each product all the product type expressions that properly describe it. For example, if a product is a t-shirt, one word, we want to label it as a t-shirt, shirt, clothing. The problem is naturally framed as the multi-label classification problem and the predictor of the trained as the series of logical regression models. Uh, we represent the multi-label structure, a graph over a various product type to use in false consistency constraints to the final predictions. We use to detect product types in query and product descriptions to create powerful fears in, in ranking models. So if we were to just pick that apart there is, is that with what's going on in the title, we've also got to look at that match down to... Uh, category level. I do believe, as like what everyone sell, says, is the title is the strongest indicator, and that kind of helps us understand as Amazon not in words together within the listing. Also, Brian. So, if I were to kind of dumb this way down, so I can wrap my head around as far as what the, the statement that you had read there, yeah, um, would that imply that in the title it kind of depends as far as the word choice that you use? T-shirt versus shirt, for instance, or T-shirt versus clothing, it may 
it may intuitively have a similar meaning, but it's not the same as maybe what Amazon considers or is showing to shoppers who have a very specific search term. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's the actual point. And then when they're measuring out the singular words to multiple words put together, because a lot of people will talk about, like Brandon just mentioned, do we increase the density? Do we increase keywords? I would say you can do if it works to you. I know uh, eight figure sellers that do that and it, it, it works for them, but it doesn't necessarily seem that way when you read the science literature and look at some of the presentations from the A9 team. It, it, it seems to me, and I may be wrong, it seems to me that their algorithm is smart enough to, to detect that, to like you, there's not a necessity to, report, uh, to, to repeat numerous times in the listings. But again, that's just an interpretation. Yeah, I would say that you don't need to repeat the same keyword multiple times in the listing. As a matter of fact, I think there's dangers to that because the algorithm might pick you up in a position in your listing that gives you less credit than you want, right? You want to kind of create a hierarchy of where you put keywords based on relevancy and search volume and ranking juice, like a score that we give it. Now, what you're saying, Danny, is absolutely right. I think that uh, those descriptors, even though they're sometimes dropped, they sometimes aren't because the algorithm is only an algorithm. And mm -hmm. that's where you run into danger of putting, um, you know, confusing the algorithm, which yeah. is like the biggest uh, pitfall that we try to teach, you know, our, our members and, and that we try to avoid, which is, Although it may not be the most readable, but if you're going to start putting in the features and the benefits of your product into the listing, you're going to end up in a position where sometimes you're going to block yourself from ranking for relevant keywords because Amazon's not going to think that your product is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so what's we an are, example on that you've observed? So on, on, uh, yeah, so like, for example, if you're selling like a kid's uh, tool chest or a tool um you know, like, a, 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 you know, or you're selling an adult tool chest, and you've got nuts and bolts in it, like the, you know, if you put comes with nuts and bolts, now, all of a sudden, Amazon might pick up and think that you're selling a bunch of nuts and bolts when you're not you're selling a set or a kit. Right. And, and so you're ranking well for nuts and bolts, but you're not selling well for you're not ranking well or able to rank well for a kit you're blocked at like a 30 to 40 rank. And no matter what you throw at it, you're not going to be able to break that wall. And that magic wall that Amazon gives you is basically saying it's, an, it's a non-relevancy wall. And that's what we like to call it, where it's like, if you can't break through and stay ranked well, it has nothing that sometimes to do with uh, the normal ranking mechanisms of conversion and click-through rate and relevancy and revenue. It is 100% indexing, and, or it's the relevancy piece. Got it. Okay. Anthony, are you seeing any kind of uh, questions that we need to bring up on this topic? Um, people the in the chat is actually, else? people in the chat are actually debating which is more important traffic conversions, which I think is really cool. Um, thank you for starting that, Steve. I, I, uh, I wanted to see how many would gang up with me on traffic, but it's, it's right? pretty evenly it's split. It's pretty split so, though. So um, for Steve, like when you said about traffic, is that all in traffic or relevant traffic? Just to be clear. Uh, that's a good question. I, I, I would say the answer to that's technically both, right? Because even if I'm getting less relevant traffic, I'm still going to increase my overall relevant traffic. But, it, but if we talk about conversion rates for just a moment, because that does kind of infect the, that question, you know, if we were to rope all categories together and say the average conversion rates eight to 12%, right? Now I realize every category is different and that doesn't cross apply everywhere. But if, if that was accurate and true, and we said, hey, my conversion rate is 20%, and we looked at all the data, I would say you're leaving sales on the table, your conversion rate's too high, you should be heavily focused on driving more traffic, even at the cost of finding some less relevant traffic. So I, I'm very much a traffic driver. Um, I think PPC does have an impact to SEO, even though the A9 algorithm update may have diminished its value. My best seller on my product uh, under my brand name Monster was ranked organically number one for the term wine glass. It was, uh, I'm not drinking alone. I'm social distancing, funny, silly, stupid wine glass. And it got banned from advertising right around Valentine's Day weekend. And with, and it went from organic slot number one, which had been steady for, you know, weeks, and then ended up dropping over the course of the next few weeks down to slot 40. 
when we lost some of the PPC traffic. So, so organic traffic does take into effect a lot of different factors. We kind of touched here and there on some various different things, everything from um, the relevancy score, the engagement, the past sales, PPC, uh, conversion off of SEO specifically, uh, offsite factors, as well as your seller metrics. Like I'm just literally just jam packed the entire you know, I'm algorithm update in a soundbite. Um, but, but, but all of these things in effect do have a cumulative effect. And I think if you do them all, even if you do them all with a C's get degrees mentality, you're going to have more traffic than you could focus on one or two of those at an exceptional level to try and get the conversion rates. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because when we can talk about traffic overflow, some of the bigger aggregators, because they're, they're driving so much across so many different brands, they can see different patterns to an individual seller. And we know that the, the strength of the outside signal and stuff. One of the other things is from the literature as well, you've got negative and positive labels. So a positive label will count clicks, add to cart and things like that. And the negative label works under the proviso of what you didn't do. So a ne negative attribution could go to, let's just say you land on a search results page for dog chews or whatever, you choose number three. A negative attribution goes to one and two and four and below for that, because what they're doing is, by the sounds of thing and through the literature, is that they have the negative and positive labels because it comes down to the relevance factor as well. And Amazon wants to know just as much, and this is part of the hunger score, which is something we won't get into today. This becomes just as important to Amazon what you didn't look at and what you didn't touch versus what you did. And then there's an attribution score as well. So it's very interesting with the external traffic thing is how do we balance off the negative kind of positive labels and sending a shit ton of traffic, do you know what I mean? And, and making sure that it's not having an impact negatively because of the nature of the traffic. That yeah, and, and, and exactly right, Danny. And I think that uh, Stephen touched on it and, and nailed it. And I'll try to like extrapolate off of what both of you just said. Previously, if you were driving outside traffic and it impacted your conversion rate and your click-through rate negatively, it would negatively impact your keyword ranks. Um, PPC has been impacting keyword ranks significantly for better part of two years now, whereas before it didn't. You used to be able to just throw as much money as you wanted at any given keyword and the, whoever spent the most would rank the best. That's where that traffic, when you guys are arguing between traffic and conversion, which one's more important? So I'll, I'll argue this. Outside traffic, regardless of how well it converts, doesn't impact your keywords negatively anymore. It can only impact it positively. So traffic is the answer for outside traffic. But for PPC and for internal traffic on Amazon, if it converts poorly, it will negatively impact your keyword ranks. So conversion is more important for traffic that originates from within Amazon. Yep. And so it is a, it is a both. Both of you guys are right but it's where the traffic originates that matters. Yeah. yeah, that's why I was asking the question. It was posing the question because it's like on one side, you read the science of it. And on the other side, people are having great results sending external traffic. It's like, where do you balance that? Well, absolutely. And external traffic has been a huge uh, opportunity because you're going to get a lot of halo. You're going to get a lot of, even if you're not targeting Amazon, if you're just running ads and running it directly to your own site or other marketplaces, people it's trust the overflow. Amazon more. Yeah. Yes, they will the go phone. search for your branded search terms and you can monitor that increase, that halo effect uh, for in your branded search term search volume. Yeah. I, I would just add one one other wrench into that mix too of external traffic of, of what we think about in terms of the, the buyer quality that's coming through and landing on that detail page or running through the search results and how that informs the, uh, really to the conversation of traffic and conversions, right? Because from... You know, our, our sort of working hypothesis with this emphasis on buyer quality came about when there was, let's say, more black hat activity. There was the use of bots that was dri driving invalid traffic and Amazon detecting that, invalidating it and sort of equating that to lower quality buyers. Right. And so now you have this uh, precedent that's been set and that then informs some of the future ranking factors for buyer quality. And then we have to discern, OK, what makes up a quality buyer? What, what is Amazon looking for? And there's things that we can infer, but if we kind of tie it back into this use case of, of when we're thinking about like embed and ter embedded terms and um, optimization, I think we've all worked with, you, you know, many of you guys have your own very large brands, worked with big brands. They're going to be as compliant 
meeting the style guidelines, they're, they're going to be very much in the spirit of what you're aiming to achieve, Brian, of very much conversion ready because traffic is inherent. They have that halo effect. They have the, the outside attention to drive to Amazon. And because they're fully compliant, maybe not even what we would consider fully optimized, you know, they're not doing an, a, an abundance of keyword stuffing, but they have the virtue of driving quality external traffic organically and that tips the scales. So, sure. yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll add to yeah. that, Troy, and that's brilliant. The buyer quality score is a huge factor. And when I, I want to clarify on the outside traffic piece, because the signal you give to Amazon of where the traffic comes from matters significantly. And if you're, for example, if I just type my ASIN into Messenger and I send it to somebody to buy, and I'm using a chatbot, for example, when they click that link and go to Amazon, Messenger is going to tag it with a Messenger uh, ID. That Messenger ID is dirty to Amazon. And if you get too many uh, clicks that way, they're going to think you're cheating and manipulating your rank and you could get in trouble. And so that traffic is automatically considered dirty and you're going to lower what they would consider the buyer quality score simply because of the signal you gave to Amazon for the link. So not all outside traffic is the same and how you signal to bring the person to Amazon matters for, uh, for you know, that, that piece that I talked about where traffic is more important than conversion for outside traffic. Um, and so what, to your point, Troy, you run major chatbots and you, you've experienced everything from the good to bad, the changes, everything happening the links you're using and what you're, how you're telling people, whether it's a search find buy as organic as possible, a search find buy isn't outside traffic. That looks like an organic search from within Amazon. So that's much different too. And that needs to convert well, otherwise it will hurt you. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, when you start to think about, hey, but it originated outside of Amazon, but now it's just a search find buy. Amazon sees it as internal traffic. Right. All right, so guys, um, I do want to move on. Uh, I knew that this particular, this first topic was going to probably consume the most. This, by no means, we're definitely not exhausting this topic. We could go on and on for a few hours, probably at least. Uh, there's a lot of other things that we could talk about when it comes to where the content is and what effect that has on index and ranking. But I do want to keep things moving forward so that we're uh, so that we're respecting everybody's time here. Um, I know we've got some questions coming in that are, are probably going to be answered in future topics. So let's keep it moving. Um, let me go ahead and really quick introduce Danny McMillan. Thank you, Danny, for being here. Um, uh, many of you already know is that Danny is the host of Seller Sessions. Uh, if you haven't checked out his podcast, you absolutely should. His style of kind of hard-hitting interview is, uh, is certainly enjoyable to me. He's a, a very much a, a matter-of-fact kind of interviewer, so I, I love that style. Thank you, Danny. Um, he is also the co-founder co of his agency, Databrill. Um, he's also put on, as far as the yearly conference, Seller Sessions Live, uh, the Branded by Women's Summit, which I thought was a cool movement, and of course, the annual Seller Poll. Um, Danny, do you have any angles you want to add to that? No, I'll just keep the show moving along, I think. Awesome. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Let's talk about as far as the effect. This is kind of going to be an interesting one here. So this is the order or the sequence of those terms has on indexing and ranking. This is when we're going to start getting into things as far as like, you know, do we put our brand up front? Do we have a, a, a high search term? Now, I, I will mention kind of, uh, I know we've had some conversations as far as conversion, traffic versus, versus conversion. I don't think it's that black and white. Certainly some of the things that I teach go beyond uh, just traffic and conversion. However, there, that's a very common question I'm sure we all get is, do I go after, do I put uh, a keyword phrase I'm going after because Helium 10 says it's really popular um, into, into my title, or do I focus more on relevance? Do I focus more on what's, what kind of conversion rate data can I get a hold of? Who wants to kick us off on this one? I, I'm strongly opinionated here, so I'll speak first. Uh, I do think traffic and conversion is black and white. Uh, very passionate that traffic has to come first at all times. As one case example of this, if you build A-plus content with a 1,000 words of copy, you will index for more keywords. It's proven fact that will happen. But you're going to have a lower conversion rate, especially on mobile. So you have to make a pick. It's got to be black and white. And so the order of importance does affect the sequence events, which lead to the outcome and, and, and intended events here. Um, as for the actual question on the screen here, I would absolutely try and bend the rules on Amazon wherever we can get away with it. As an example to this, I sell in the gift category, selling funny wine glasses. 
I do not put my brand name to start off my titles and Amazon has never gotten on my case about it. But if we were to do that in the health category or the supplements category, you could never get away with that. And so we do have to put the brand name in front in certain categories, but any category where it's not enforced, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, that's, I, I, I want to chime in here. Uh, order sequence of terms. So this is basically what my experience uh, has been on the platform. Basically all of, almost, I won't say all, goodness, because the algorithm is far from perfect. Almost all of the terms that are somewhere in your listing get indexed and initially they're all indexed essentially by individual word and then uh, by groupings. Over time, relevance will be assigned to longer uh, phrase terms that are out of order, but that takes time. The whole reason why the um, Bradley Sutton pointed out like the Maldives uh, honeymoon thing, the whole reason why that works is because during that beginning honeymoon period of high relevance for everything, when you're given the benefit of the doubt, the terms that are intact don't have to stitch together over time. And so they get the benefit of higher relevance. And then when you push um, promos to that, you kind of solidify that relevance. So the sequence of terms does impact early stage relevance. Um, so if there's any terms that are super important to your conversions down the road, that's why they should remain intact. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll second, you guys nailed it. I mean, you get more credit for an exact term than you get for a broad term and a phrase term and a plural term even. So, I mean, it's just, uh, we've seen the, the, we've seen how they're treated differently. The amount of credit you get is different. You run an event through a uh, diaper caddy and you're trying to rank for diaper caddies. You're going to get 70% of the credit. If it, if it's a phrase match, um, and it's like felt diaper caddy, uh, versus diaper caddy, you're going to get about half the credit. So you, it's the only way this distribution of credit to hundreds and thousands of keywords uh, is the only way that Amazon can figure out relevancy and the algorithm can understand relevancy uh, based on uh, the, any given event, because it can't wait for an event to happen for every single keyword. It's impossible, right? You're going to have keywords that are only searched once a month, but you're going to get indexed and ranked for them. And so, but you're going to have things ranked 10 or search 10,000 times a month that you never have a click or anything happen where you can rank very quickly. So we can rank. This is one of the reasons that what we do with our research and our in-depth keyword research is create that master keyword list, identify the roots that are repeated the most amount of times, understand the search volume and the relevancy of each keyword so that when we build our listing and we do a launch, we can rank for hundreds of keywords in the first five days. And we understand how to do the match type to get the most credit. So yeah, order matters significantly. Uh, and then the signals you're giving to Amazon matter significantly and where you build it matters significantly. Now to kind of clarify that, that too, you, you use the term as far as exact phrase and broad, um, and I, I don't want to have it confused. Match type, yeah. Yeah, as far as match type, as far as like PPC match type. No, not just match, not more. just for PPC, but for, for how you build your listing and how you rank. You're going to rank right. differently in a different position for the plural of a keyword and the, and the, uh, the, the, the singular of a keyword. Even, even the plural versus the singular, you're going to rank differently. And a lot of people uh, don't know the difference and will build their listing wrong, prioritizing a keyword that has a third the ranking juice as the other one, right? If you choose the plural one, but the singular was, was better, you can shoot yourself in the foot now from a relevancy standpoint and from a ranking standpoint. And I now, what I'm also saying that, for instance, if you've if you got a, a keyword tool that tells you that diaper caddy and caddy diaper have the search the same search volume, obviously there's a different conversion volume there. There's, there's a different reality as far as how it converts. So what you're suggesting on that is that even, you, know, you may have what appears to be basically the same popularity, and yet uh, you're not going to get, in other words, Amazon's going to know exactly what the conversion rate are, is. They're not necessarily going to um, share that with us <laughs> easily. Um, and so if you, you do have to go through and figure out which one actually converts more in order to get that ranking juice, in other words. Yeah. So you're going to, you're going to have a higher relevancy for one versus the other is what you're saying. So, 
Like we used to do all this manually. We'd create the master keyword list using Helium 10 data and all that. But now we have a software that does it automatically for our members, right? And so in five minutes, we create this massive list and it, and it prioritizes roots. What you're talking about is roots. Diaper and caddy are singular words that are repeated many times. As a phrase, diaper caddy is repeated many times throughout all the different keywords, much more often than caddy diaper. So what we're going to do is we're going to assign a ranking juice score to diaper caddy and a ranking juice score to, di to, to caddy diaper. And the caddy diaper uh, juice score is going to be much lower than the diaper caddy score because it's repeated and has such, so much more of a broad search volume, phrase search volume, than the, uh, the other way around because less people call it a diaper cad or caddy diaper versus a diaper caddy. And so you have to do all of this analysis across how many times each thing is repeated, how much broad search volume is associated with it, and uh, how relevant it is. So you have to take in the relevancy piece too, and you multiply it all together and come up with this ranking juice score that we give it. And that's how we prioritize how to build our listings. Yeah, I'll add that on the title, one of the things that I teach certainly is, um, you know, keep in mind the, the mobile platform that has... Um, you know, a limited, you know, limited view as far as like how much, how much text, how many bullets you see, how, how long the title of the title. Um, I'm not suggesting that you have a 75 to 80 character title. You can use a full title, but uh, as far as order is probably the most compelling uh, terms and words that you're using to talk to the shopper should definitely be in that first 75 to 80 characters in order to hook. And that I'll get into that more as far as hooking. Um, <laughs> That didn't sound right, but more of the, <laughs> the first 75 to 80 characters as far as how critical that is to actually have the visibility that shoppers can see. Can, yeah. can we talk uh, can, uh, canical URLs for a moment? So uh, Dan, part, Danny, well, I think, so Dan, hold on real quick. Danny comment. had something that he was interjecting, I think. Sure. Danny, you had a comment on that? Yeah, it was just a quick one going back to what Anthony was saying, talking about the honeymoon period. So in a nine terms from the literature and the, and the stuff that I've seen is called a dead start. And they used Harry Potter book as an example. So they have day zero, day seven, day 14. And it's about that discoverability of getting from zero to somewhere else. And we've called it floating up the, the search engine, like being discovered. You know, you're getting that early juice. Well, that comes into play with the hunger score as well. So there's as, as a, as a, a the extreme example on the Harry Potter book, what they had to do was is that the day zero, the day seven, day 14, the popularity kicked in, but the movies, one of the movies are out, but the new book wasn't. And so they will joke about, you know, when the algorithm's gone wrong, because we get complaint from the business department. And then they'll do an, a manual override. I'm not saying that they'll do that for us, but what's kind of interesting, when we look at the honeymoon period and we look at those first few weeks, the dead start, they have to start from somewhere. So day zero, day seven, day 14, and make adjustments, some case in special occasions, they were just those, uh, so they would adjust those manually. I just thought it'd be interesting as part of that is that there's one thing to think about being ranked, but how do you get discovered? And, and part of that, it would be a longer conversation is the hunger score, because the hunger of the score gets in that category, the more it's looking uh, in depth. And so it gives more opportunity for other products that to what we would call floating up, up to the top. Yeah. Any last comments? The canonical one I want to actually save for the on off, on, on off Amazon uh, discussion coming up here, if we can. Uh, any other comments from the, the panel or um, you know points of view from the panel or questions from the audience? I would just add those are all immensely strong points. I think um, I think if somebody's just jumping in and watching this is just trying to maybe zoom out a little bit and realize that these are all like elements of one recipe, right? This is like everything intermingles to arrive at what matters for ranking we're, we're trying to compress into a little yeah. over an hour or something we could probably do a whole weekend workshop on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But each part, I mean, you know, honeymoon, non-honeymoon, um, thinking about looking at keywords both ways. So like, you know, gar garlic press, stainless steel, stainless steel, garlic press. Um, there's different ways of arriving at it. And as we'll touch on, I'm sure here too, is then where are you weighting those things in your listing? You know, where are you placing them to still utilize those relevant keywords, but there may be some that are more conversion ready, ready and on the nose and others, you just don't want to miss the sales potential that are inherent in those, those phrases. Okay. All right, let's keep things moving forward here. Uh, I do want to welcome, of course, Troy Johnston. Thanks for being here, Troy. Uh, Troy, as many of you know, is the founder of Seller Tools, which has uh, uh, you just recently launched that uh, the LQS 
uh, listing optimization, which is kind of a cool tool. It's definitely uh, a lot more advanced than what um, Helium 10's Chrome extension has currently, so I like it. Um, it, it covers uh, most of, uh, you know, quite a few of the areas that I like to see when I'm doing kind of a listing analysis. So uh, thanks for, for bringing that out as well. Um, your focus, data, optimization, automation strategies, tools. It sounds like uh, kind of a common theme among, uh, among, among this group here. We're a bunch of researchers in-house here. So uh, welcome, Troy. Yeah, thank you, Brian, for bringing us all together. All right, so let's uh, talk uh, maybe briefly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, traditional, what I would consider to be uh, traditional SEO as far as more keyword driven versus advanced, which I would consider to be differentiation and benefits. And I realize the titles that I'm using on this is, is debatable. I, I, I can appreciate that. But from an indexing and ranking standpoint, I want to kind of define um, my point of view on this. And then I want to get some feedback and shoot down anything that I'm saying here. The traditional SEO is what I typically saw that was taught by ASM, where we take as many high traffic keywords as we could, and we put it into the content as much as possible in every possible spot. Um, I think we've evolved uh, quite a bit since then um, in order to be more, um, you know, to try to speak more to the consumer, but I think it definitely could go farther on this. Now, one of the things that I look at from an advanced differentiation and benefit standpoint is... Sorry, I've got somebody backing up with a backup alarm next to me here. Um, the, the differentiation is more of, we were talking about traffic versus conversion. Well, I look at it from the standpoint is you can get, <laughs> I know I'll get pushed back on this, but you can get a ton of traffic. But if you don't have the differentiation, if you don't stand out from your competition, right? If you don't differentiate yourself from the crowd, you're not going to get the actual click through. You're not going to get that engagement from the shopper, even though your listing may come up frequently. Now you could argue a bunch of different ways on this, but, uh, and then the benefits side I look at is another hook in order to, of course, get them to, you know, you're getting the eyeball, first of all, that's the differentiation. You're getting the hook as far as in the title, maybe to pull them over, to beg a little bit of curiosity, differentiate yourself a little bit more in the title from your competition. And then in, within the product listing, you're actually focused on speaking to the consumer not the search engine, focusing on the benefits, the what's in it for me to the consumer in order to increase the conversion rate. So that's one of the reasons why I was stating earlier is I don't think it's as black and white as traffic versus conversion. I think there's, there's some other parts of the funnel that need to be addressed in the middle of that. Wait for Stephen to fire back. So <laughs> I've already, right. I've already on, stated dude. that it is black and white. The traffic has to win, but... I think, I think the audience is split on that. Yeah, and I, I think I agree with you. You made a statement earlier too, is that, um, and then maybe others can concur or, or refute it. And that is, um, if you have, um, if you're indexed um, and ranking for more traffic keywords, you're likely to be picked up for even more keyword phrases. Um, I think that's something that uh, I, I've definitely, I, I've seen, but I still, I don't know necessarily if that is, in other words, you're going to get a lot more traffic and probably a lot more visibility. And that's going to outweigh, presumably that's what you're saying, Stephen, is that right. if you can multiply your traffic, which is easier than trying to multiply your conversion rate, then why wouldn't you just multiply your traffic, you know, solve the, the front end of this and then worry about the back end of it later on. That's, that's exactly it. If we were talking about click-through rate or CTR, I'd be having a different conversation, right? Obviously, CTR has a massive impact on your SEO, as well as the likelihood for generating a sale, right? So the main image, if we were talking about main images, it has massive implica implication on relevancy for the search term being used by, by the potential prospective buyer, right? Um, but, you know, just to kind of take a step back, I think, I think Troy made a very good point. There are some people that are diving in and they're just like overwhelmed by the technical speak that we have. Um, I think SEO should be treated in multiple phases. I think one of the things I, I typically indict frequently is that a lot of people think SEO is set it and forget it. And right. so for those that are watching this, take some incremental steps to improve your SEO you're not going to ever check this box off. It'd be, it'd be like a equivalent of me saying, Hey, Brian, I'm going to give you $10,000 for my PPC campaign for a new product launch, but I'd never want you to adjust any bids or set up any additional segmentation campaigns. Go. That's how people treat SEO for the most part today. And so the panel here is, is basically going to be in alignment that SEO is not set it and forget it. 
Um, you guys can chime in if you disagree, and that you need to continuously work on it, right? Um, and, and the way that I like to separate it out is into three SEO phases. In phase one, it's all about indexing. So conversion is not even a conversation point in phase one. It's all about indexing for mass. We like to call phase two the pink word update because in the back end of the dashboard inside of Seller Central, they give you access to see non-value surplus keywords and they put them literally in pink ink. If, you, if you're watching this and you haven't seen this before, go into your brand analytics dashboard and check it out because you can switch out the pink keywords and rotate them for incremental indexing gains. And finally, after you've done that, once you have 50 keywords in ranks 20 through 50, I think you're ready for phase three. And that's where indexing is done. You're all about matriculation of, of, of putting those keywords from ranks 20 through 50 up to ranks one through 10. If you run the playbook that way, basically by day 30, you got 1,000 to 1,200 index keywords. By day 60 to 90, you've got 1,500 keywords index. And then finally, when you're rotating into phase three SEO, you're going to rotate 50 keywords up to the top 10 results. And if you do it that way, you'll have maximum gains, in my opinion. Yeah, I usually take the approach as far as like going after the long tail that has less competition just to get traction right away and then build on that as a foundation, which is kind of similar to what you're, you're covering there. Okay. Um, just kind of a side note here before we get additional comment. Um, is uh, if you are uh, wherever you're watching this, either the live or the replay, be sure and add in your comments down below so that we can try to follow up on those. Um, appreciate that. All right, Troy, did you have something you were going to throw in? Yeah, I think, you know, and I know that this point is the spirit of, of I think, more of the traffic and, and, um, and conversion conversation. And really the way that, um, you know, similarly, a, a workflow, I think, really informs how to, how to approach and tackle tackle this. Um, and I, I, I think of the example of like soft serve when you get like chocolate and vanilla sauce, you, you, you want a nice proportion of both to make a nice tasty soft serve. And that's really where both of these come in is how you incorporate relevant search phrases and capture that buyer intent, but then ensure that you are truly conversion ready uh, with the entirety of a listing too, right? With your images and factor in that in the search results, you get, you get this much to show of what is meaningful to earn the click. And then you have the entirety of a listing from which you can, you can use a tool, you can use a process to cons consistently validate, uh, invalidate points, um, set up your index alerts, set up your ranking alerts, set up performative century-based activities that monitor what's going on with your listing to where even if you do work through a workflow, pretty much everything on Amazon is compare and contrast. You're, you know, if you, if you really dive into A9, a lot of the things that we, we unpack is uh, comparative add to cart. It's, compar it, it's comparative metrics. It's very rarely in isolation and saying, oh, well, this, this listing has, has earned you know, top spot. It's always a relative right. metric. So right. yeah, my workflow is pretty, pretty straightforward with this because I think there's an 80-20 of a R2A brand analytics listing optimization based on the weighting of listing elements. And if you do that, you know, I, I think, I think there's usually a lot of complication that's thrown into the mix. Um, but if you do something like that and then check your performance consistently, um, it's just like software. It's very iterative. You see what works, you capture the feedback, you adjust as needed. And it's an, on, as to Steven's point, it's an ongoing process. You're, you're hardly ever at a finished product. Right. So I'm kind of curious, let me throw out a quick question on this one. So uh, panelists, show of hands and those who are on live, uh, put a five in the chat um, if you follow the 80-20, the Pareto principle. Because I think that's kind of what, you know, kind of, you know, leaning back on what you were just saying, Troy, and obviously what Stephen was saying earlier is uh, there's certain levers that you can pull that are going to have a lot more, that are easier to pull, I should say. Um, and maybe that outweighs some of the things that maybe that should be done, but maybe are more difficult to accomplish uh, in the end. And so pick your battles as far as how much time and resources you've got available. Um, you know, some of us have, uh, um, I think Steve and I, we've got similar sized agencies. And so we have like teams of teams, but um, not everybody's got those kind of resources. So it's, <laughs> if you're going to do it yourself, definitely pick your battles, definitely focus on the 20% that produces 80% of the result you're looking for. Um, I, I want to chime in on that too, because I am, I don't want to say I'm split. I understand the in integrated nature of both 
traffic and conversions being important. On the conversion side, I do talk a lot more about, you know, psychological triggers and the point of, and the point of kind of creating a, a brand presence in the mind of your buyer so that you can carry that off of the Amazon platform. And I still stand for that being incredibly important to longevity. But to Stephen Pope's point, aside from just saying, hey, traffic is easier to get, some of the research that we've done over the years, one of the most interesting, I think, is if you take any big seller, any successful seller that ranks very well for big keywords and run a reverse ASIN report on them, you will find nine times out of 10 that they rank page one for thousands of terms. You look at those terms and separate them in an Excel spreadsheet, you will find that 98% of them are over four words long and 98% of them get less than 500 searches a month. So to the point that Steven was literally just making, the, you know, there's a correlation. I understand causation and correlation are not always the same thing, but there is a correlation here with high rank, high velocity sales listings and having tons and tons and tons of ranking of seemingly meaningless or seemingly unuseful keywords, uh, which stands to me to mean that um, either they've established a lot of traffic uh, sources in the past, or maybe they started with that from the beginning, realizing that traffic and then increasing index uh, can lead to relevance of more keywords and therefore more visibility and reducing your conversion rate down to 12% actually doesn't have the detrimental effect. And outweighs that method may outweigh spending so much time trying to get your uh your conversion rate up to 30 but having okay. yeah, so i'll add to that anthony that the uh the conversion rate is unique to each keyword and that's what matters for ranking on that keyword and related keywords right okay. so okay. if you were to index for thousands of irrelevant keywords and you get some clicks and some sales and the conversion rate and the click-through rate is very high but the conversion rate's very low that doesn't impact your ranking for the keywords that are relevant that if your conversion rate's good on those. Thank you for the clarification. So, so one of the other things I think is kind of loosely connected to this ongoing conversation is, you know, who should be in charge of the SEO at your company, right? Are you going to put the designer in charge of your SEO who's making that conversion play or should it be the analytics guy who's looking at the data chopping it up like Anthony and Troy talked about and look, looking at thousands of iterations of keywords and finding the most relevancy in them. Um, so I, I, think, I think the analytics guy needs to be in charge of your SEO plays. If you're ceding any control of this to your design team, you are missing out on indexing. I'm going to do the exact opposite on that. <laughs> <laughs> The yeah, I'm all, I'm all about like uh, data and finding the right keywords and indexing and uh, driving as much relevant traffic as possible. So I'm with you there. Like, but the point is, I think you need both, right? Because if you, um, if you don't convert once you get the click and your conversion rate is lower than your competition on that specific keyword and related keywords, then right. you're, you're, you're going to slide. Yes. So getting a bunch of dead traffic that doesn't convert doesn't matter. So you do need to have a good content team and you do need to have good keyword research and ranking. So you need traffic and conversions. There is no one or the other. It isn't black and white. I mean, we keep saying it is, but it, it really, uh, you have to have both. I guess what I'd throw in there too, from a, from a software perspective in, in terms of who we think or, or who I think uh, more specifically, uh, tackles or addresses um, keyword re research in a, let's say a typical Amazon centric business is that my aim would of course be to make sure it's simplistic enough that pretty much anybody can step in irrespective of title and understand both the strategy and tactics to arrive at meaningful keyword research. I think where there's been kind of an opportunity and I, I think you know we try to realize the advantage of this is that now that there's a lot of sellers, a lot of brands, and through the growth, attention, and capital in our space, it's a lot of people doing things a lot of the same ways. And so the opportunity, I think, for different providers, different softwares is to sort of say, hey, if you see a lot of people doing the same thing and, and the, the spirit of what they're doing is to create differentiation, it's, it's 
it's sort of illogical. It's, it's really, well, what's your point of difference? How are you approaching this differently? What's your unique take? Because we brings us back into those relative comparison in a compare and contrast marketplace, but you see it hordes of people potentially doing the same exact thing and leaving some of that index ranking and performance to, to chance. So to kind of tie that into like, you know, how, how we try to think, okay, let's make this very simple, but un understand that this is a contextual problem for softwares. And even some of the biggest is we're creating a scenario where everybody's learning the same thing, but we want to give our users a distinct edge because that's, that's the ideal win-win, right? Um, it creates a very unique scenario uh, in that sense. I will, I've got a couple of points to, the, to kind of add to both um, to both what Stephen is saying and also you, you Troy. Um, on the, as far as like who does SEO in a company, um, my experience is that a lot of companies do it incorrectly. An example on that, as Troy pointed out, is you get this sea of sameness. You know, you get, you know, like so much consistency in the search results that everybody kind of looks the same. That creates a situation for banner blindness for those of you who from the Google days, uh, where they no longer see uh, their eyes never track to see who's different. Um, it all looks the same. Then, then they start looking at the wrong, they start looking at things like price and reviews as opposed to, is this a better product or not? Um, and so that's, I, I'm a strong believer in differentiation and standing out from the competition, from going, doing, trying to do the opposite of what a lot of competition in a specific niche is doing, if you can, if you can come up with that. The reason I think that, I, the, one of the things that I do see though, is that within a lot of brands is, they don't tend to, um, if, if they put it, if they hand it to somebody who is the analytical guy, um, who's looking at the keyword research, then they're probably biased by the, the metrics that are provided with those keywords, which, which may skew, you know, it may be skewed data, but they tend to be biased in order to say, the content needs to have these keywords in here because they have massive search volume, according to who, right? Amazon didn't provide that, that data. It's, it's, um, you know, it's kind of, it's estimated based off of, off of tools. It still can be used, right, as a benchmark. But at the same time, I believe that a lot of the, the those who are highly analytical within a company are likely going to use the, data, the keyword data as is and say, this has a priority without really taking into context relevance or buyer intent or really what is the intended audience for this product and really seeing it from the, from the shopper's standpoint of what's going to grab their attention, what's actually going to feed their interest of the product and really solve their need and really speak to them with this product is going to solve your need in these areas and create that more of that emotional decision-making, which can increase conversion. I think, I think another theme that's coming out here is we're talking about big data and a lot of small time Amazon shop owners might be asking themselves right now, how can I compete against big data and all these companies? And there's like $3.2 billion that have entered our space in the form of Amazon aggregators just in the last 12 months. And, and I think the answer to that is you totally can. You can compete against big data because you have access to the same quality of tools that they're using, right? And not only that, if you have the high quality product, here's where I will seed some conversion ground, right? Like, I don't think you can be more or less relevant on your keyword selection, right? Obviously, I'm, I'm a mass index fan. I think the relevancy to your conversion comes most into play is after you've indexed for them, how do you convert them with your listing? And that's where your photo and your A plus content then comes into play or the quality of the product that you've selected. Um, as one case example, I launched a product, a Mother's Day kit, three weeks before Mother's Day this year, and there's plenty of room to grow on Amazon. So a lot of people are like, oh, it's the best time to sell my company. I'll take the money to sell to these aggregators. And I think, I think that's crazy. I think it's never been a better time to be on Amazon because there's so much room for growth. So this, just this one keyword example will prove that. Two years ago, pre-COVID, the term Mother's Day gift was hovering at around 900,000 search volume during the week of Mother's Day. COVID comes around, basically doubles the search terms, right? Everybody got 10 years of, of growth in eight weeks during that time period, right? So, of course, the keyword volume was up, right? What happened this year, though, was it basically doubled again. And so a term that had 900,000 search volume during Mother's Day week is now coming up on 2.5 million 
this year. So I launched a product three weeks before Mother's Day, ranked organically number three on this term, sold $135,000 in three weeks with zero external traffic, one single product review, and only spending $11,000 on PPC. So if you, if you think, if you're wondering, can you still do this? Can you still follow all these SEO best practices and launch and differentiate? 100% you can. I want to keep things moving here because I know we've got a few other topics to, to cover quickly here. Um, I love the fact that that those of us, you know, we were able to come together today and have differences of opinion. I was that's kind of what I was hoping for, that it truly would be more of a debate and there's different points of view. But those who are listening in, that kind of tells you is that look, you probably don't have the same kind of access to data or the same connections that, that those of us on stage may have, um, that you may have. However, there's a lot of gems that you can, you can pull out of what we're saying here. There's also, you realize that not everybody's on the same page, which means that there's more than one way of doing it. You don't have to do it perfect. You have to just make the effort in order to try and you know go after traffic, go after conversion, go after the, 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 the sticky, the gooey middle that's in between those, right? Um, in other words, there's still, like, like you said, Stephen, there's still opportunity for any, even somebody who's coming up is it's not so saturated that somebody new can't come in. They simply just need to pay attention to what is some of the best practices, like what we've been talking about here, pick a path, go with it, and just put the effort in. Don't wait around until you get a perfect answer because there's not going to be one. All right, let's go ahead and move forward here really quick. Uh, welcome to Brandon Young. Thanks for being here. Uh, Brandon, of course, he is the founder and lead instructor for Seller Systems. If you're not familiar with his systems, go ahead and uh, uh, check out his site there. Um, I won't go into too much detail here. I'll, I'll let you, Brandon, is there something you want to point out uh, before we keep moving on here? Um, glad to open it up for you. No, I appreciate it. Uh, so we have a community uh, called the Inner Circle. Uh, we've got 900 plus active members, um, about a third of which are seven figure sellers. Um, and on top of that, we teach a bunch of content, do weekly calls, lots of support, handholding, but uh, more of a mastermind with an abundance mentality. We also have Great. some internal tools that are accessible only to members that do a lot of what we're talking about today. Awesome. Thanks, Brandon, for being here. All right. So let's talk about uh, as far as content locations. Now, we did cover some of this, uh, kind of revisiting this a little bit, because I think that there's some things when it comes to content location, um, there's things like images. Obviously, uh, machine learning, AI technology is developed enough that uh, images can be interpreted, but by how much? You know, it's kind of hard to, it, it may be a little bit hard to read as far as how much the Amazon understands the, the content of an image, let alone what I see on a daily basis, which is a main image that has one main product and then 15 accessories all packed into the same main image. Bad. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, how much of they can actually read that and separate those, but there's content as far as in images, in videos, uh, obviously the, what we've been talking about, title, bullets, description, A plus back end, uh, alt tags, um, from, from that, from a standpoint of indexing and ranking, if you were to pick, well, let me open it with this question is if you were to pick uh, what's your highest priority location to nail when it comes to content as far as target keywords, for instance, or image? What yeah. would you start out with? So we always prioritize the, uh, the, the title, obviously. Like we, we find that it, it indexes the best. You get the most ranking juice from it. Now, some people will use like the, some of the back end, like subject matter uh, search field gets a lot of indexing credit. But we warn our members not to use it because it is slowly being taken away from a lot of different subcategories. We're finding Amazon doesn't want you to use that, that space, even though it works really well. So that's the, yep. that's the danger that I'll tell everybody to, to be careful of. Like if you hack your way, take advantage of different things that currently work, just be aware that things constantly change in Amazon and they could just say, push a button and that no longer indexes. And all of a sudden now, you know, you've got a pro best selling product that has trouble ranking. Um, and we've seen it happen where products can just die overnight because of the subject matter field being deleted or um, them accidentally deleting a field that had a bunch of keywords in it and then they need to build it back in. So uh, try to try to stick to the fields, you know, Amazon wants you to get credit for, I think. 
Yeah, the, our, our observation definitely is that Amazon can always, any, at any given day or week, Amazon can have a false flag uh, or you know a false read of your content or your account and create a problem for you. We, we pretty much have those conversations with seller support every single week just because of something that Amazon did, not anything that the client did, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and someone just asked about what about intended use target audience style? Yeah, you might get some indexing and some credit there, but I would avoid it. Uh, really, search terms is really the only one they want you to use for that, I think. Yeah. Well, I will also then, add on the Amazon, some of their content filters have kind of ramped up this year, too. We have definitely seen that more where the adult flags are getting uh, picked up for things like, I think, Stephen, you had mentioned before uh, the example of, like, say, a wine glass, for instance. Um, we've actually seen similar products that where one of the lifestyle images is a, you know, a group of, you know, people sitting around on the patio and they're all drinking wine and they pull that listing because it popularizes um, drinking alcohol. It's like, okay, so now they've got an ethical backbone that they're building into their filters in the process. They, they, they take out the Christian stuff too, though. Like, yes, hey, they you, do. You know what? That selling is... a Christian t shirt that says catch up with Jesus. Yeah, that's banned from ads. Yes. And, and it's not, that doesn't apply to all religions. We definitely have seen that when it comes to where there's a, there is definitely an anti-Christian bias and, and I don't have an opinion as far as that goes. I'm just saying that's our observations. Uh, primarily, no, Amazon's on, morally wrong on that one. No doubt about it. Well, but I would say is it, is it, you know, we've seen that more with like coming from the Pope himself. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'm the Mormon Pope though. <laughs> Uh, sponsored brand ads, br content that goes into sponsored brand ads, we've definitely seen is even more sensitive to things like uh, religious content or, um, you know, more, you know, they'll, they'll flag things as far as being political, being, uh, you know, faith, you know, being objectionable, you know, whatever. Um, I think I, I would like to, I'd like to point out really quick, though, despite the content filters and despite indexing, but certain uh, portions of the, uh, of your listing, like getting stripped away by Amazon. If we're talking about content locations and their importance outside of indexing, also title keywords are assigned higher relevance. So they don't just index. They're also automatically giving, given a relevance, uh, you know, benefit of the doubt because they're in the title, just like H1 on a website. But if you're asking the question, which content location I think is the most important, to Stephen, Stephen's point, I think the main image because that's going to increase sessions, and that is there. That is internal traffic. That's where you get click through rate, right? Yeah. Right. That's just my. I opinion. think for conversion, it's the second image and it's the first bullet point, um, and it's your 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 first image for your A plus. It's what people are going to see next that uh, the benefit of the product to them that's going to sell it next. But in order to get that initial click, the main image. Um, the pricing main image and, and uh, the, uh, the review count or the review rating are the three triggers. They're the only thing you can really see in a search field, right? Like in a, in a, in a list. Y yes. Um, I, I would say that you can definitely um, enhance the hook and engagement through what's in the, what's visible in the title simply by standing out in the words. Um, certainly I, I would say that definitely, you know, price and, and reviews, are definitely going to be a consideration that people have been trained to look at, you know, as the kind well, of that's yeah. that social proof, right? The, Plus, the, is it the price point that's right for me? The title is also very, very important. You're right, but there's a reason why the, the the main image is on the left of the page. Literally, the first thing people see that is the thing that's going to determine whether they look at the title, whether they even scan the review line, uh, whether they look at the price, anything. I would also argue that just as a consumer. I bet there's a good portion of people that look at the main image and then also scan directly to the price. Well, yes, because I know certainly like in our, in our business, um, as probably each of you are too, is we, it's, it's normal for us to be having a bigger fight because we're representing somebody who has a product that is 10, $20 more expensive than everybody else. And yet doesn't really have anything that differentiates their product yet. They want a solution. Right. So that's usually the hat that we always have to put on all the time is like, okay, how do you solve for the fact that you've got a more expensive product? We want you to have a more expensive product. We want you to have higher margins. Um, but ultimately you've got to stand out. You've got to, you can't simply just copy what everybody else is doing and look exactly like everybody else on page one. Otherwise you're not, 
you're not going to stand out. Nobody's going to consider you any further. The only thing you're going to get is a curiosity click of why are you $20 more expensive than everybody else? And if you don't answer that in the first five seconds, then you're probably going to bounce and you just paid for a click. Here's an example of when you can buck the trend too. So back to my mother's day kid example, my brand name was age of sage. Uh, and I launched with a pink wine tumbler. Everybody else was selling all kinds of different colors. Teal was hundred percent, the most popular because I went with pink, even knowing that pink was probably way, way not as preferred. Like we're talking like one to 10 ratios, but because I was the only one selling the pink cup, I was able to increase my CTR and my relevancy scores with SEO and conversions. So sometimes you can use the data to make a decision to go an opposite direction. If everybody's selling the same product, sometimes something as simple as a color differentiator is enough. Works for me in the gift category. That obviously won't work in some other categories. It goes the other way too. Speaking from experience, selling a bright yellow baby carrier when nobody <laughs> wants bright yellow is probably not the best thing you can do. I got do. four kids under six. Somebody pee on it? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Um, I like Brandon's uh, answer to uh, a question that Asim uh, had asked as far as um, selecting a brand name in a particular nation. And I, I completely would agree with you on this, Brandon, is that uh, brand names should be short so that you don't waste valuable space. I'll also add that if, it, if the brand name can be anything that stands out from the crowd, in other words, it has uh, any kind of characters that catch people's eyes things like letter X or double O or double C, some of these kind of things just naturally catch the human eye um, or it uh, actually adds to kind of a, um, it implies an additional value or something additional about the product by the brand name. Um, but these long brand names that are two, three words long, uh, two words, you know, still long by, by Amazon title standards, but yes, I completely agree with that is try to keep it brief and then try to keep it. If you're, you know, uh, it, it, it try to keep it relevant to your product and what, what you're trying the messaging that you're trying to communicate to your target audience. Shorter your brand name, the harder it is to get, um, a trademark longer. It is the harder it is to fill it into your title. So right. it's, it's yeah, that's like a, a middle of the road. Very good, yeah. Um, anything else to add on this particular topic so we can keep this moving? No, I, th I think Brandon brought up, yeah, great points. That's, that's essentially how we treat it too. Title is, is right up there. And um, Brendan, my partner at uh, Seller Tools, did a really interesting case study where he used a single server and plugged in different phrases in different locations over like a 40 hour, 48 hour period of time. And it was a really interesting uh, validation for uh, weighting of listing elements. And we would see that too with title. So we did front of title, we did back of title, we did subject matter, we did search terms. Um, and I think it's now become more common knowledge, but things like bullet points and descriptions are, are just not weighted as heavily. Um, and if you know some of the workarounds too, you can have like an infinite number of bullets. So it's kind of like, you know, it, it's there, but it's not super, super impactful. Um, but I think more of the A plus content, the points that we've touched on in terms of indexation, how that real estate is used and especially in the, in the context of longer tail, let's say you're not so obvious keywords. Um, I think that adds an interesting fold to the mix, probably falls squarely in the middle. Um, but I think we view the, the weighting pretty, pretty similarly. Okay. One of the things that I use, certainly I use a, a, what I call a five second rule when it comes to the images and the bullet points. And that is if you've got so much um, information that you're trying to share in a single image or a single bullet point that the, the shopper can't consume it and understand what's in it for them within five seconds, you've gone too far. You've put in too much. I like All that right. litmus test. That's a really good one. It's, it's kind of hard to hit sometimes, but yes, I, I like using that one quite a bit. Uh, that's a good transition, actually. So let's welcome Stephen Pope. Thank you for being here. Uh, Stephen is uh, the founder of My Amazon Guy. We were having kind of a previous uh, discussion where uh, Stephen and I have not actually been on stage together yet. I think I've been, you know, shared the stage with everybody else, but except for Stephen. So um, mostly because I think we operate in, we've got two different like channels as far as our audiences uh, live. And so I'm glad to finally uh, get you on to one of these shows here. Um, 80 plus person uh, team out of Atlanta. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, up there as far as the, the agency size. 
Um, now you handle more uh, account management too, right? Not just like in a specific area, but you handle things like uh, actual listing management as well. We do full service PPC, SEO, catalog, and design. Okay. Cool. Very good. Did you have anything else you want to add to this? No, nobody cares who I am. They just want to hear our SEO tips. Well, I know, but I got to make sure that everybody gets uh, gets their 15, uh, 15 microseconds of fame here. I, I want to hear uh, more from, uh, from Danny. I think Danny's got some juice he's holding back. Danny's, when, Danny's when, fallen in the rabbit hole of uh, Amazon.science research papers. I know because I'm currently in that rabbit hole too. And that's why every other word is hunger score because that's the only thing he's been looking at for like 30 days now, I think. No, there's some other stuff. I, I just I'll keep it on task. We've got to move through these subjects because we're kind of, Brian's got to get to the end at some point at 20 past. We'll be right. going an hour and 20. And so I thought I'd hold back on this one because you guys have got it. Very good. So let's talk about effective on Amazon optimization upon off Amazon search. Now, this is also going to bring up the whole idea of canonical. Just for those of you who are not familiar with what a canonical URL is, it's a mouthful. Uh, think of it as like, so uh, for instance, on a, in, from an Amazon standpoint, in your title, Amazon will typically create a canonical or basically a URL that is specific to your ASIN. Um, that includes a set of five words, right? And usually what they'll do is um, if you've got a long title when you first start out, they'll pick and choose their own uh, five words out of the title. And sometimes it's not the words that you want to go in that title. Now, there are certainly some tricks as far as to, to revisit that uh, through a hyphen. Um, but then the way that, that URL is picked up is it can be used by indexing by off Amazon resources. An example, Google search, for instance. Who else wants to kind of append to that and then talk more about what effect on Amazon optimization has for off Amazon search? A canonical URL can be set after you put a hyphen after the first five words. And the question I have for the panel is, does that matter? How much of an impact it is? I actually don't know how to evaluate this one. It makes for a prettier URL, but um, yeah, as far as the actual impact when it comes to Google traffic, I, I haven't measured it myself. I'm hoping maybe somebody else has. I Probably it, not much if you're not doing anything with it. So if you want to, you know, the, the good thing about Amazon listings, uh, because you won't be able to sink, sink the big shit, if you were just to boost a load of angel links to it, some you know some scrappy links to the listing, then you're going to have an opportunity to rank. It's not great, but people still do this to a day to a point. Um, but if, regardless of the canonical URL, if you've got no no weight for that page, then no one's really going to find it or discover it unless it's on a really 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 localized low search term. So the URL is great. You, you get that right. But then you've got to do the next step, which right. is something in order to give that page some weight and some value. That's a very good point. It's not just a magic ball. The, the, once you do it, you're like, okay, great. I don't need to do yeah. anything else. I'm going to magically show up on Google search. Well, as we all know, that's not going to work yeah. in any situation. You'll appear somewhere on Google search. Right. Sometimes, sometimes. Sometimes Google is actually, so I've done a lot of testing of this. Yeah. Right, like using Google operators to uh, force Google to bring up a page, and Google appears to be slower than Amazon with regard to stitching together certain terms and then actually indexing a page. So sometimes you won't show up for a while, and you yeah. might not even show up until something signals relevance to Google. And uh, on Google, with, it's going to take you six, seven months. You know, you you edge your bet on what you're looking at rank. It's far more sophisticated than A nine, far far more, right? And so it's going to take a much longer time to rank those keywords. It's a long-term plan. Now you could go and get some really decent link builders and pay 500 to a thousand dollars for a link and then spend time and give yourself, right. Okay. I'm going to invest here. I'm going to build backlinks to my Amazon listing, but I'm going to do this over a seven month to a year period. And even then you're not always going to hit the bullseye because you don't know how much volume you're going to get and what the relevance is it going to be in terms of sales for you. So they're just longer bets. And if you're a bigger company and you've got the resources, then you can spend the money to do so. But it's a long game. Yeah. So with regard to the canonical, in my experience, um, the canonical URL, is, it's almost like it's almost 
impact is almost like a BSR. It's an after the fact thing. Like it doesn't dictate relevance on Amazon. It is more how the listing will appear to the, the wider internet. So the keywords inside your canonical do matter to Google. Now, this is not a direct impact. This is an indirect impact. But if you have an important term in your canonical and that helps Google to index that, uh, that URL and therefore your listing page on Amazon better, if through that you end up ranking somewhere good on Google and conversions happen, yes, Amazon absolutely tracks traffic from Google that converts into a sale. That matters to Amazon. If that happens, you're in a good place. But that is so like around the bend with regard to the importance or the manipulation of what's in your canonical URL. Uh, but that, in my experience, is the, the relationship that the canonical has with your listing. Okay. Anybody else I want to I want to make sure that uh, before we move on to our last topic here that if you are live watching this um, or even if you're watching the replay make sure you add in your questions now so that we if we can try to catch these before we wrap up or if we see them in the, the replay broadcast um, that way we can um, try to address those as, as best as we can uh, from the panelists side of the house any last comments or opinions on off Amazon optimization versus off Amazon search, it kind of, it, it kind of, you know, I know one of the questions that kind of spins off of this when you talk about off Amazon searches, should you work on driving your own uh, traffic from off Amazon? And I, I'm pretty opinionated on that one. <laughs> and I'd say absolutely yes, um, because there's a lot of opportunity in order to reach your target audience outside of Amazon and bring in your own, uh, your own people, if you will, your own target audience. I think it's the future of Amazon. Hardest to do, hardest to measure. Agree with that. And obviously Amazon's trying to incentivize that lately with, you know, by giving uh, kickbacks, which uh, seems to me like they're, it's not quite digging up the, uh, the, the affiliate program, but it's almost like an affiliate program for driving traffic from off Amazon over to Amazon, which I think is, um, it's good that they're, they're, it's kind of it's kind of a signal as far as how Amazon views the need for it now, um, as opposed to simply just always being the top of the game. We don't need to do anything else. Um, they're now probably feeling a little bit of pressure, maybe from some of the other platforms. Uh, but I think it's still to your own product, to your own brand. I think it is very smart that this is the year that you look at. Um, how do you start reaching out and talking to your target audience directly? Not simply just selling a product because it looked good in product research. And I will say, I will kind of, I'll give, I'll give uh, Brandon a, a bump there as far as uh, I've gone through his uh, uh, product research uh, methodology, methodology, and it's probably one of the best ones that I've found. So nice job on that. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the last topic here. Um, I don't know who this guy is, but um, that's me. My name is Brian Johnson. Uh, I am one of the co-founders for Canopy Management. I also co-founded PPC Scope, Sponsor Products Academy, uh, Amazon PPC Troubleshooting, some of the other things. Um, like many of those who are, like basically all of us who are on stage today, uh, definitely we put in our 10,000 hours in the Amazon space and we've got um, a lot of resources because we've built uh, we've, been, we've made a very consistent effort over the years in order to give back to the community and to build up our resources and our network of people. And so that's why uh, we have the experience that we have. Um, so that's, that's it. Yeah, that's me. Um, let's, final topic, on-page shopper interaction. These would be things as far as like, what do the shoppers do that can affect how our listings rank, including things like searches, clicks, Add to carts, conversions. Let's just pick this one. Conversion on the continuum. So each, when uh, you're, you've got a number of features on the page which will help in terms of ranking, which is like micro credit. Someone visits the page to click on the images, they open it up, they scroll, they go up and down. 
they add to cart, all of those become signals and they're micro credits. And so what happens, even if the sale didn't take place, the organization of where your product page is placed versus others is going to be the difference of the interaction as well. And so what, that's why it's very important that your page gets the person engaged, not just reading it is like the usage of the page. And then one of the biggest steps we know is when add to cart is one of the leading signals as well, because we know that add to cart works. You can get to the bottom of page one with add to cart, but to get up to the page, you need to bind with keywords with sales. Very good. I will notice yeah. that the, uh, my observation certainly is that Amazon definitely has waiting uh, on the um, where the traffic comes from as far as off Amazon, back to uh, Amazon. Uh, and they definitely either increase the weight or decrease the weight based off of a couple of things. Here's an example. So somebody who searches on Google, for instance, and then finds an Amazon listing and then comes over to the Amazon listing. Amazon's paying attention not only to, to where they came from last, but then like what Danny laid out there as far as like what the subsequent actions that the shopper took uh, whether they're 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 searching again, they're clicking, they're at the cart, they're checking out. Um, those all are going to have their own set of of weights on this. But my observation has definitely been is that where the traffic comes from off Amazon is going to be increased or decreased depending on maybe Amazon's experience. I would presume based off of conversion data. Uh, as an example on this, I think that there are certain platforms off of Amazon that have been. Uh, commonly or frequently gamed uh, by sellers and Amazon has kind of dropped the value of those, the kind of the, the weight of those versus others that it wants to try to increase or incentivize the traffic from or sees a higher conversion rate from, they may increase the weighting uh, as far as the, the may affect ranking of a product. Has anybody else observed similar? Yes. Yeah. Um, they care about the... Uh... They take a lot of cues from Google, even though it's two separate things and even though there's two separate intents uh, and they do care about the uh, authority of the referring site. And I would venture to say that authority is big. And also if the subsequent transaction from whatever page they went to into Amazon and conversion there uh, leads to any higher visibility for Amazon. They like that too, which is why they love Google, right? If it means that this relationship, whatever just happened here in this transaction is going to mean that Amazon pages are seen by more people. They like that. And I think that's another reason why they also seem to really like influencer marketing. That's the reason why we've seen uplifts in ranking after using influencers, because anything that ends up putting Amazon pages in front of more people, Amazon likes. That's my two cents. Yeah, I, I agree completely with both Anthony and Danny's point. They kind of tie in uh, with one another in terms of domain authority, which it influencers and, and Google, Google has a, immense uh, domain authority and YouTube as a, a matter of, of, of that fact. And so you have these really strong sources and then you have the uh, typically a higher quality buyer that's interacting in that sequence. And then the shopper interactions, what, we're, what, what Amazon's sort of looking for, and I sort of chalk it up to them creating sort of a social experience with posts and lives and all these ways of, in, of you investing as a shopper more time on platform, um, completing either pre-revenue or revenue generating activities, inherently leading to a greater uh, emphasis on visibility for any related ASIN. So it's, it's kind of, you know, if we kind of take a step back and sort of take off our shopper lens or our our, or excuse me, our seller lens agency so software provider and sort of look at it, you're sort of like, okay, this makes sense. They, they want these high quality traffic sources, high quality buyers spending a lot of time on Amazon. And then they just really sort of validate sort of credit. I think, uh, as, as Danny put it, it's a, it's a strong way of describing it, credit these listings and reward them through things like keyword ranking. And it's just such a snowball effect from there. Um, but this is, I think one of the most overlooked ranking factors. And I, I, I know Brandon, Brandon knocked messenger before, and it's one of the areas where we have such control in a chatbot journey to where shopper interactions, you know, customers sharing their favorite review, dropping an Easter egg in the A plus or EBC content, some way of having them scroll down that detail page, spend a little bit more time there. You know, you weigh that against somebody who's driving external traffic and is just saying, go to buy, you know, don't, don't interact. 
when we've unpacked this a little bit, we can actually see that expediency, that lack of interaction can actually lead to a missed opportunity in, in rank benefit. And not saying that there's no other ways of doing it, but that's just, that's just one way we do it with chatbots because we own the customer journey so much that we can interact, have them come back, re-interact. And so it's, it's, a, it's a nice way to check off this, this type of box. And then we do link laundering. So we drive through different domain authorities. We clean up the customer. So we try to check off all these boxes and make sure something like page interactions, as I, as I call it, or shopper interactions, are still baked into our overall rank impact. Roy, are you actually measuring, able to measure as far as like those, you're, you're able to split test basically those who have some kind of page interaction, whether it's Easter egg or, or scroll time or something like that on it. Are you able to actually, have you actually compared those to say, there's actually the data that tells us that longer interactions on a product detail page tend to produce higher ranking or conversions or something that those who don't do it on uh, you know, a product that basically has a lesser value? I, I probably wouldn't have anything statistic. It's, it's all very anecdotal and it's really where we use it ourselves. So it's, you know, it's like a subset of a subset of a, a subset. Um, and not to say you have to do all of these things. Link laundering is something we like, if we can get the domain authority, like that's really strong. It's just, this, this is sort of that, like, how can you, if you're driving external traffic, if you're running an influencer marketing campaign, how can you encourage just just something a little bit more instead of them just going right to add to cart transacting. And then that's, you know, the door is closed. Um, so it's some, some, we should test, we should do a case study on it. Cause I think, I think there's, there's more there because we sort of know when we look at a nine and we, we even read between what we already know in terms of add to carts and we've seen wish lists work and, you know, even printing a product detail page, it may be way down the list, but that's a sign of an interaction that's taken place on a, a detail page that can imply the 200 some odd factors, you know, making up a popularity score as, as it was previously known. Yeah. I can, I can, I can speak to this really quickly. Back when I was with Signalytics, we ran uh, a test, one where we were running chatbot rebate ranking that was directly to uh, search find buy. And that was it, right? Search find buy, go find the listing, click on it, buy it. And then we also tested that against uh, running uh, rebates through search find buy, but we put a survey in the middle where we were asking the user to go to the first three listings that caught their eye. And then we're going to answer, we're going to ask them specific questions uh, for the purpose of, you know, market research about those listings. So we guided them to find other competitor listings come back, answer some quick questions, and then go to the listing we wanted them to buy and buy. Um, the, with the survey in between, uh, we noticed that keywords with similar search volume ranked faster and higher by, I mean, I wish I, get, I could give you an exact like uh, percentage, but that is something that at least anecdotally through the couple of tests that we were able to run, we, we did observe. And did you see ranking stick too, Anthony on those? Uh, yeah, well, um, unfortunately I couldn't see, uh, di uh, directly. And this is probably because of other factors. Like we weren't running them anymore. We weren't running them for as long and they were different categories. So I can't say that I saw one noticeably last longer in that position than another. I suspect that that is in fact what will happen, but we need to set up the test parameters right. better for me to give you that definitive answer. We, we found that what sticks matters for the offer, like the value of the offer at that point, the quality of the offer. So how it continues to convert versus the competition at that point. It's like uh, Steven's wine glass was doing great, driving a lot of traffic, converting, getting a lot of extra boost from the PPC that was doing well. And then as soon as PPC stopped driving the extra interactions, um, it, it, it fell to the competition. So you can rank something well with whatever you're doing, but if you constantly have to prop it to be there, then your offer isn't as good as your competition. Um, and so that's why, it's important that you still focus on the fundamentals, which is maximizing the way you build your listing, maximizing uh, the, the, the product and the offer and making sure it's going to convert well. 100% true. Yeah, the, the sticking will definitely have a much stronger link to conversion can, metrics. Can I quickly, on the point of sticking, say search find buy as an example, 
one of the things I've looked at, and maybe you guys will agree, disagree. So let's just say you're doing a search find buy campaign. You run it for a period of time. So if we think about the strength of conversion rate, and so we look at a search find buy, you do 100 as an example. You tell people, use this keyword, search and buy. All 100 people do so. That's 100% conversion rate. When you stop that campaign and it drops down to, say, real shoppers, that takes it down to 20%. So there's a case where your product could be good, well-optimized page and everything else, but it's an unsustainable conversion rate in most cases. So that's why you do a top-up campaign. Next month, you go back again and again and again. So I think that's the key thing to look at as well, is that sometimes it's not the stickiness of your product and whether it's good value and everything else is the unsustainable. Conversion. Yeah. There's, so there's two aspects there, Danny, you're absolutely right. The first is like, you should know with precision what's required to rank for certain keywords and what keywords are impacted by the event, because it's more than one keyword. You're targeting one, but it's impacting hundreds or dozens you know, yeah. at the very least. Right. Yeah. And so, um, you should know that instead of 100, you only needed 10 over the course of four days or six days. And so you could make sure that your conversion rate wasn't too far outside the norm. And so you need to track your conversion rate throughout that entire launch period or relaunch period, that ranking period, and make sure that it's better than your competition, but not insanely too high. And the other part of that is when you're running search find by, like you said, you send 100 people, they add it to cart and they purchase. The ad to carts were a major trigger for, for cheating for a long time. So these click farms, these massive farms, they had 100,000 you know, cell phones sitting in a warehouse and all they would do is add to cart all day and that would rank a product to the most competitive keywords there was without it ever selling a single unit. And so what Amazon but did is- But that's only to the bottom of page one rather than up the page. Well, it could mm -hmm. rank to the top at that point. Like we're talking right. about two okay. years ago when, when add yeah. to carts had all that value. Yeah. So people, people understand now, like there's all these things going around in different circles and people have an anecdotal evidence that, hey, search find by is good. Now everyone starts using search find by, but they don't understand that uh, if you're too far outside the norm from even an add to cart to conversion ratio, Amazon's going to throttle that credit because they know that it's not normal and they monitor what's, what is normal. And if yep. you're outside of a standard deviation of normal, then all you're doing is sending bad signals to Amazon and they're going to punish you for it. And the same, rate and yeah, review rates, another thing. So you you have to understand a Amazon's algorithm. What is it going to take to rank the, 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 you know, for each individual keyword and all the keywords, you have to understand what's normal and you have to understand what signals to send and what not to send. So even everyone saying, Oh, search find buy is the way. And every single VA in Pakistan and Philippines will tell you, I can rank your product. It's search find buy, but they don't know why they don't know what the hell is, is, is there's a, like the underlying part of that. They don't know the other part of you know, what not to do. They just have read this. They saw it somewhere. Some fake gurus put it on YouTube and, and now it's the way, but you know, the reality is that the, the algorithm's complex and that's why we're having this conversation. Did they help yeah. you with A10 as well, Brandon? The, mm. yes. the A10 is the way to go. That's A10 uh, is absolutely. Yeah. Without a doubt. Is that the next slide. <laughs> that's yeah. Right. No, but to that point, you're absolutely right. Back in 2018, whenever all of those uh, wiki pages were leaked from Amazon China, you, we saw that they have that Amazon specifically has metrics called uh, add to cart over expected add to cart and right. then purchases over expected. Right. There's literally a ratio that they know is normal. Yeah. And anything that lands outside of that normal ratio, like Amazon knows you're doing something. And if you produce a pattern of it over time, then you're going to start getting flags. And we know that Amazon carries a grudge because you, everybody's got a seller profile and a buyer profile and they keep it from years. I had something that came up uh, just this week that was from five years ago that came up and they said, oh, well, we can't approve you to have access to this other account because of this thing you did five years ago. It's kind of like, because I disagreed with one of your employees, like really? <laughs> <laughs> so apparently I never stopped doing that, but, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, it definitely is, it is a long memory for sure. Um, anything else to add to that last topic there? Um, I know that we've got with somebody who is uh, raising their hand, we're not going to do any open questions on this. If you put it in the chat, then we probably have addressed it or can really quickly, but I do need to respect the time of the speakers we have here up on stage. We've gone way over. I really appreciate each of your, uh, your time on this going the extra mile. 
there's so much more that we could probably come back on in the future and talk about other 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 topics. But this um, this interaction with this group of experts definitely fulfilled my hope of what this interaction would be. That we'd actually get out here, not agree on everything, and but able to come together and say, you know what, this is the way we think it is based on our experience and these are our opinions on these topics and just get it out there so that people really could get a better education of what, what is actually working well these days. Here's one thing we can all agree on. This is why we do what we do. We do it for our families, our kids, and, you know, go give your kids a hug today, guys. Nice to be with you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as Troy had uh, suggested, everybody should go out and get a soft serve uh, after this. So, um, <laughs> I do want to wrap this up really quick here. Obviously, we've covered a number of things um, today. Um, whether or not you caught us on live or watching the replay, I do want to have your comments. We actually do pay attention to new comments that come in, uh, whether it's tomorrow or next week, whatever the case is. Um, I definitely recommend, let's see, did I actually put in? No, I didn't put in. Uh, let me shoot back up here to the top here um, just to kind of give a, a refresh here. Today with me, of course, my name is Brian Johnson. Uh, with me also from Canopy Management, I've got Anthony Lee. Uh, we brought uh, Stephen Pope in from my Amazon guy. Uh, now here comes the whole, uh, the seller uh, series here. So uh, Troy Johnson uh, out of uh, seller, seller Tools, sorry, Seller Tools, let me get that right. Danny McMillan out of Seller Sessions and then Brandon Young out of Seller Systems. Did I get all that right? The whole seller galaxy. We're all... Yes, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I just wonder if any and of these and guys you know what? There wasn't an and there wasn't an ams in sight. We've all got sellers on on our on our brands. Yeah, no zon. It's to. It's zon and ams. No yeah. zon this time. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah. So let me go ahead and uh, stop the share here on this one. Um, uh, Anthony, do we have any other uh, questions that we missed? Um, I, I do want to, from everybody who's, who's live on the Zoom call with us, um, you know, on a scale of one to five, give us some feedback, you know, give us a five if you thought that we just knocked out of the park today. Um, just let us, you know, give us some feedback. Should we do this again in the future? Brandon says one. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, there was a question that got asked. Unfortunately, it was at a time when the answer wouldn't have been relevant to what we talked about. Uh, Faison had asked the question, Amazon is improving store visibility by including the related stores and keywords suggestions in the search bar. What would be the criteria of the store to be, to be shown? That's a great point. We did not include store as one of the, the fields. We'll cover stores next time. There you go. We can is certainly that, do that. Yeah. Is that is that a whole separate topic? Uh, uh, I mean, I guess it could be. I don't think I, I could appreciate talk about you having me, guys. Like... It was always great to see you and um, some of the yeah. most brilliant minds in the game. Thank you for including me, and uh, I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you for thanks, everybody. For Have a fantastic week. Thank you. We'll see you. Everybody. Have a good one.